I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Thanks for joining us on another Open Mics with Dr. Stites program. We are on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. How many of you like snakes? I don't see too many hands going up. If you're like most of us, you may cringe at the thought of running into one of those critters. You know, they're not really cringeworthy, though, just to say. And if you live in Kansas, you are likely, though, to maybe want to cringe some, because some but sometimes snakes get a bad rap. Joining us here in the Dolph Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio to talk about snakes is Dr. Steve Thornton, Medical Director of the Poison Control Center and an emergency physician here at the health system. Steve is also a toxicologist, which makes him especially qualified to talk about this. We'll also be talking with Dakota Johnston, who knows firsthand what it's like to be bitten by a snake. And we'll be live at the Kansas City Zoo where Alexis Del Cid will be talking with zoo director Sean Putney about these fascinating creatures and why they are so often misunderstood. Here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to be talking about snakes on a plane. I promised people I would make that reference today. Now I've done it. We can move on. Not snakes on a plane. Of course, we'll also be checking in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, medical director of infection prevention and control, to see if we're making any headway on our COVID patient numbers. Questions from our viewers are an important part of this program. We want to hear from you. Get your questions sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and the Medical News Network. You can find those links right here on your screen. Let's start with a few facts about snakes. They are some of the most beautiful and misunderstood animals in nature. And I actually, I really believe that. I kind of like snakes until they're too close to me. But they are also very important to the natural environment. Snakes are found throughout the world, existing on every continent except Antarctica. And throughout the world, they are sometimes loved, but often feared by humans. The name for an intense fear of snakes is, wait for it, here we go, ophidiophobia. Say that again, ophidiophobia, the fear of snakes. In the last two years, more than two and a half million snake bites around the world have caused 100,000 deaths and 400,000 long-term disabilities. Just to say it right out loud, far short of the numbers in COVID. These are the often occurring in the poorest and most rural communities of Asia, Africa, Latin America, South America, wherever, and here in the United States. But in the US, it's not quite so bad. The CDC reports about seven to 8,000 venomous snake bites a year with about five deaths. In Kansas so far this year, we've had 36 calls from across the state to the Poison Control Center about snake bites. A normal year is 40 to 50 calls, but August is the biggest month, and we're just getting to the middle of that, that month. Dr. Thornton, welcome to the program today. Thank you. We want to make sure people know the right world. Oh, boy, good Lord. Right word, and it is venomous, not poisonous snakes. Can you tell us the difference? So, yeah, that's a common uh, mix-up, I suppose, is a way to put it. And, uh, Poisonous is something that contains a toxin like a mushroom, like a mushroom is poisonous, but you wouldn't call a mushroom uh, venomous. Venom, uh, venomous creatures have a mechanism to basically take a toxin they may have and uh, apply it to other organisms, whether through fangs or stings. Uh, so a venomous creature like snakes, wasps, spiders, they have a poison and they can um, apply it uh, in, in a, a way to either defend themselves or hunt prey. Whereas a poisonous organism, if you eat it, you're going to get sick, but it doesn't have a mechanism to stab you. The, thankfully, mushrooms don't have fangs. Okay, so I have a question. Do you have ophidiophobia? I do not. I, I've uh, long kept snakes, uh, all non-venomous, I will add, but uh, I have uh, had many snakes in my life. Okay, well, we're not going to go too far into that. But I do <laughs> want to point out that the world-famous Indiana Jones did have did, ophidiophobia. Yes. So snake bites are rarely fatal, but snake venom can cause a serious harm. Tell us more about that. So, so we do have venomous snakes. Uh, we, we have about six species here in the Kansas, Kansas Missouri area. Um, primarily pit vipers is what we are dealing with in this, in this area, and primarily copperheads. So copperheads are our big problem snake. Are pit vipers what Indiana Jones was afraid of? Uh, well, pit vipe, uh, Indiana Jones, I think, was running into cobras. And I would probably have odidiophobia about cobras as yeah, well, okay. knowing what, what I do about them. But uh, uh, the copperhead is, a, is our uh, number one player in this area as far as venomous snake bites go, though we do have some rattlesnakes as well. And the bottom line is with any of the pit vipers, their venom is a, is a complex mixture of different chemicals. But what it all does is it basically causes a lot of 
pain, swelling, tissue destruction, and can cause some problems with your blood work, uh, can be a very significant medical event. You know, I think your glasses could have passed for those that Harrison Ford wore, <laughs> wore but your hair needs to be dark a little bit. Just saying. Need a little right. more of it, too. Yeah. <laughs> Is a snake bite more dangerous for a child than an adult? So, th there, there's a, uh, interestingly, there, there's a myth out there about small snakes being more dangerous than large snakes, but what we do know is that uh, little kids do get sicker because it's a dose uh, event. It's basically, the snake doesn't really measure you out. Uh, the snake will apply about the same amount of venom for an adult or a child. Obviously, child being smaller, that's going to be more venom per body uh, area, body size, and the kids can get sicker, yes. So as the designated snake center, I'm not quite sure what that means, but designated snake center, do we keep venom on, or not venom, we keep the antidotes so, on hand? So yeah, we, we do uh, uh, advertise ourselves as a comprehensive or a designated snake bite center. And what that basically means is that the health system has made the commitment to having the personnel the facilities and the treatment, the anti-venom available to treat whoever may have a snake bite in the state of Kansas, state of Missouri, uh, in this area basically. Because uh, anti-venom, which is the treatment for, for venomous snake bites, is, is expensive and not every hospital uh, carries uh, what would consider an adequate dose of the anti-venom. We don't have that problem, we got plenty of it, we can treat people uh, adequately and successfully. And sometimes a snake bite can actually get a lot of local reaction. You may sometimes need a plastic surgery, a lot of tissue necrosis right around the bite. Uh, it, it's, it's a very, very painful, a lot of tissue destruction, exactly. You like to have follow up with the appropriate uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, luckily, if you get to the right facility and get treated appropriately, a lot of that can be prevented. Yeah, and how, how long do you have to get to the right facility? It's definitely a time-sensitive uh, uh, medical event, and I would say you want to get with to, you know, to a hospital within an hour or two because the thing about antivenom is it's not going to reverse any damage that's already occurred. It's going to prevent further damage. So the sooner the better uh, is, is uh, I think, a, a good takeaway. Okay, so do all hospitals have antivenom? Most will. Some of the smaller ones don't, and that's kind of where we've kind of stepped in with the poison center and the health system, trying to help those uh, smaller facilities who, unfortunately, sometimes see more snake bites because they're out in the rural areas where people are interacting with, you know, the, the, the snakes. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's something that's not universal for sure, uh, and, and antivenom is very, very expensive. I'm not going to deny that. So uh, there's some hospitals that simply financially just don't want to make that investment. We've made that investment, and we have plenty of it. Dakota Johnston is one of our guests on the program today. Dakota, you were bitten by a snake. How long ago was that? Um, that was back in 2017, um, and it was a copperhead. All right, and where were you when that happened? Um, I was actually uh, camping out with a group of friends. All right, how far were you for medical help? Um, actually, not too far. Um, I was camping out at Clinton Lake, um, close to Lawrence. Um, okay. So not too far at all. <clears throat> um, and that uh, picture you see there is the initial bite. Okay. Did he bite you more than once? Um, he actually attempted to um, um, because I actually stepped on the snake and didn't realize I stepped on the snake. Um, so he actually was going back for a, a second strike. You can tell there is a like a third uh, puncture mark, uh, very slight um, there. So how sick were you? Um, oddly enough, um, I did pretty well um, through it. Um, I'd say the worst part was probably um, the week after the fact of getting bit and um, after getting uh, the anti-venom. <clears throat> but the initial bite really, um, I did okay through and um, my stay in the hospital wasn't that bad. Um, but the aftermath was um, the swelling of the foot and the leg um, was the worst part, I will say. Um, did it, it hurt a lot at the time of the bite, I take it? Um, so oddly enough, since I stepped on the snake and I kept walking because I didn't realize I actually got bit by a snake, it was like, um, it was like a very, um, strong, like bee sting. Um, so it took me a second to realize what had happened. Um, and then I turned around and went back because it was dark and turned on my flashlight. And then I was like, oh yeah, that's, um, that's definitely a poisonous snake. I think that's a copperhead. Well, it's good that you knew. So what'd you do? Um, so I went and got a couple of my friends, like, um, to make sure, like, yes, this is a copperhead. Um, and then several of my friends um, were like, oh, you can't do a whole lot for that. You just take some ibuprofen, um, <laughs> wait it out. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that's not what we're going to do. Um, so then I had a friend of mine uh, take me to the hospital in All the right, ER. Which, and did you end up here at KU or did you go to Lawrence? Where'd, where'd you go? 
Uh, no, I ended up at Lawrence. All right, and they had some anti-venom for you? Yes, yes, they do how, have the anti-venom. And how did that go? Um, relatively well. Um, I only ended up having to get one dose. Um, I know some people ended up having to get um, definitely more than one dose. Um, and I spent the night in the ICU and got released the next day. I know some people um, have a more traumatic experience. Um, I was lucky enough to not have um, too rough of a time. Excellent. We're going to go to the Kansas City Zoo in just a minute, but Dr. Thornton, talk to me a little bit. When he says didn't have to, what is the rough time people can experience? So uh, obviously the, the venom of these snakes is, is designed to work fairly quickly. So generally, uh, you know, what he said about the kind of feeling like a bee sting, that's a very common presentation story. They say, oh yeah, I, you know, I didn't realize I was even bit. Until maybe a couple, two hours later, if you don't seek care, um, it'll definitely, you'll start to feel it. You'll see the swelling. You can see on the, some of the pictures, yeah, it's kind of that bruising, that ecchymosis there. Um, and that's what it does. It just, it's, it's, it kind of begins to uh, digest you a little bit. Um, uh, very painful, very, a lot of swelling. Uh, and as long as you get the antivenom within a, a relatively short time frame, you can kind of stop that and then, and then your body just has to recover from it. I tell people like, for instance, where he was bitten, it's gonna be like the worst sprained ankle you've ever had. It, it's gonna take a couple weeks for it to get better. It doesn't just kind of get better overnight. But obviously the longer you let it go before getting antivenom, the worse, worse it can be. So now if somebody got a copperhead bite, could they die from that copperhead bite? And how would that happen? So, you know, when, when his friend says, oh, there's nothing you do about it, I, there, there is a, a uh, an urban legend that you know you don't you don't get antivenom for copperheads because they don't they don't kill people and, and in general that's that's true but uh, there's a lot of suffering and pain involved in it and and we do I think as as healthcare professionals we like to relieve pain and suffering and that's what you're doing basically with the antivenom studies show that folks who get antivenom get back to basically doing what they were doing before sooner they have less disability they need less pain medication so there's certainly benefits for getting antivenom in copperheads is, is it life saving. I will, I, will, I will grant that, that fortunately copperheads do not kill many people, so that, that is good. Um, but still, it's, a, it's very painful, very, well, I would take antivenom if I got bit by a copperhead. Yeah, and you can lose a lot of skin and even have some limb endangerment. Some and, and, and there's cases where people just never, they're, you know, if they're bitten in the hand, it's just never the same after that. So uh, it's certainly, like I said, it's not, it may not kill you, but uh, you're going to remember it. All right, well, they may know a thing or two about snakes at the Kansas City Zoo because that's where Alexis Del Cid is live with zoo director Sean Putney. Alexis, how goes it this morning? I see you, you're holding a snake. I would never have guessed that about you. I'm just going to be honest, Alexis. I didn't see you as a snake whisperer. Dr. Seitz, you know I like to live on the edge. Come on yeah. now. The, the yeah. only. The only bad part about this, you guys, is I have an itch on, on my right eyebrow, but to itch my eyebrow, I would have to bring the snake closer to my face, so I'm just gonna muscle through this. Okay. Um, I'm holding Ron. Ron is my new friend, and I'm here with Sean Putney, who's the director of the Kansas City Zoo. Um, how do you know Ron's a boy? Uh, you have to do a little invasive search. So like for, for, most, for most There's, snakes, yeah. You have to go inside of their vent, oh, okay. their cloaca, and uh, if it's a boy, they do have male reproductive parts down there. Oh, interesting. For, In like but but the for most area. snakes, you can't tell a male from a female. Now, uh, that being said, usually the bigger <laughs> snakes are females because okay. they are doing the, the bulk of the reproductive. You know, this snake in particular holds eggs inside of them, so they need to be a little bit bigger. Okay. So if you have a, a, a Kenyan uh, sand boa like this, sand boa. that is over 30 inches, chances are it's going to be a female. So th this is a sand boa, though. It is. Uh, a name Ron. Now, I'm glad you brought up the females because we have this, this always, this reminded me of the movie Twins because right next to Ron, I have Louise. This is like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and this is Danny DeVito, <laughs> but reverse the, the genders. Um, Louise, is she the biggest one you have here? Yes, uh, she's about 15 feet long. Uh -huh. She's a Burmese python. Uh, and, and you can see the color on Burmy, uh, on uh, Louise. That's not natural. So for those of you who are thinking, what a pretty snake, you wouldn't find one that looks like that out in the wild. They would just get picked off by a predator. Um, they rely on camouflage, especially when they're young, to survive. And then when they get older, to help them with their ambush pred predation. So Louise, that's her natural reaction to being safe? 
Is she turns bright? No. I mean, what, why is that's she so bright? Un, that's bright? unnatural. That's just a genetic deformity, really, oh, that wouldn't, okay. wouldn't be good for them in nature. But that's something that you'll see in a captive environment. Uh, it's just been bred that way. So it's not, not a normal coloration. They wouldn't okay. survive in the wild like Got that. Got it. Boy, that'd be nice for us, though, to see. You could see if you were about to step on one. True. Tell me about Ron as far as I... I I should have asked you this before I was holding Ron. Is Ron venomous? No, uh, okay, we do good. not have any venomous uh -huh. snakes here at the zoo in, in our collection. We do have some that are on grounds, but um, I wouldn't have given Ron to you if, uh, <laughs> if Ron you. were venomous. Thank you for that. Do even non-venomous snakes bite? Yes, uh, okay. so that's kind of a misconception that uh, constrictors still have to bite their prey. Usually they'll, they'll be laying in wait for their prey to come by. First reaction is they bite them, then they twist their bodies around them to suffocate them, and then they consume them. So they, they still bite, and they still have teeth. If you were to open up Louise's mouth especially, uh, you would see that she has some very large teeth that point backwards to her gut. Ooh, Louise is the big one. Yes. So what would I see if I opened up Ron's mouth? Same thing, smaller scale. Okay, good, that's good for me. Um, what does Ron eat for breakfast? So we primarily give small uh, mice to our snake collection. Okay. Um, so he could fit a whole m mouse in there. Yeah, different sizes for different okay. snakes. Uh, right. For Louise, it, it goes up to larger rats and uh, even guinea pigs and, and uh, we'll give rabbits too. Do you feed them live prey to m mimic their environment? No, uh, so that's something that uh, if you put live prey in, you take a risk on the animals that you're actually feeding, doing some damage to the animals that you're trying to feed. So the, oh, if, you put a, if you put a rat in with them, rats fight. have teeth too. So it's possible that they could, so could bite the snakes. You free, freeze them. You they freeze are, them? We, we, we don't grow our own here. We bring uh -huh. them in, so they're right. shipped in every couple months. Like ratsicles. <laughs> kind of. In the hot summer. I have one last question. Actually, we've got a lot of questions for you, Sean, but I do have a question uh, back in the studio for Dr. Thornton. Um, earlier in the broadcast, we had talked about how we'd had um, 35 snake bites this year so far, but it's only August, and a typical year is 40 to 50. And I just wanted to ask again, about that, have we had a lot of snake bites this year or is that typical because now we're going to start heading into the cooler months? I, I'd say we're on route for a fairly typical year. You know, we've gotten in the last couple of years up to as many as 60 bites in a, in a season. Um, so I think we're, we're heading for that kind of 50-ish range. Now, you know, um, nationwide we are seeing, you know, a lot more copperhead bites in particular over the last uh, 10 years. It's kind of interesting. Fewer rattlesnake bites, but a lot more copperhead bites. And the reality is, as people move out into the country, suburbs, I mean, push out, I mean, they, they run into snakes more and more. And so, uh, you know, we have seen some general increases across the country in, in snake bites. But Kansas, we kind of stick fairly close around that 50, 50 range or so. And I think that's where we're going to hit this year as well. Alexis, you are so optimistic. Well, you just said we're heading into the cooler months. I know you're a news <laughs> person. I'm not sure you're a good <laughs> weather a person. It's just a thought. Just a thought. I mean, we, we <laughs> occasionally still get bites in November and December. It's, uh, you know, whenever it gets warm enough out there, some of these snakes will start to yeah. move around and, and uh, run into people. All right. Thank you, guys. When, when you guys come back to me, I want to ask Sean about things that we can plant around our houses to maybe deter snakes from nesting around All our houses right. and our properties. Scare and uh, some other questions snakes. about that. All right, scare across for snakes. We'll be back <laughs> that in just a minute. He's we know there's probably a lot of questions out there. Let's go head over to the studio and talk to Jessica Laveau. I've, Jessica, do you have ophidiophobia and can you say it? I can't say it and I don't want any part of snakes. I, I was just as surprised as you when I just saw Alexis holding that snake. No way, no how in a million years. So you are not going to go on live to the zoo today. That's what you're saying. You're going to let, gonna you're gonna let Okay, well, glad to see your She's generosity. Better you woman than me. Better woman than me. <laughs> so, Dr. Right. Stites, uh, good to see you, by the way. We do have a few questions, so I want to try to get to these. Alice says, uh, this is why she doesn't like snakes. Alice doesn't like them because she can't tell which ones are venomous. So um, to either of our guests, how do you tell which are which? You know, that's a great question because just be honest, you don't really want to get up close and personal to figure it out, Steve. So, so first rule is just consider them all, just leave all snakes alone is a, is a, is a good, uh, good mantra to live by. 
If you're the very, very inquisitive type, uh, you can look for certain characteristics. Most of the, the, the venomous snakes we have in this area are going to be fairly bulky, kind of almost fat kind of snakes. They're not going to be that, that ribbon, fast-moving one that you see zip across your yard. They're going to have kind of a triangular head. Uh, those are kind of more obvious clues. Uh, obviously, if you <laughs> see the fangs, you know you're dealing with a venomous snake. But in general, I think the, the, the good advice is just leave all snakes alone. Most snakes don't want any part of you and just, just uh, leave, leave them alone. Sean Putney at the zoo. I'm going to, are, are, is, is Sean still alive? Okay, no worries. We'll get, I'll get, I'll get back to him in just a minute. Okay, Jess. Okay, so um, question from Yen Liang. Uh, he says there are also many snakes in Taiwan, especially in the mountains. So he wants to know what should we do if we are bitten. So what should we do if we're bitten? We're not close to any sort of medical care. So as we got so, it. So I just a quick, real quick. I don't think you're supposed to suck on the wound. That used to be the thing when I was in Boy Scouts a long time ago. We even had the little suction kits. Exactly. And, and so that's one of the that's one of the big challenges with snake bites, especially in, in, in some of these unde, underdeveloped uh, third world type uh, situations where there is not a lot you can do other than antivenom. Uh, uh, what we recommend people do is basically um, kind of treat the, uh, you know, wherever they're bit, just treat it kind of like you, that's a broken limb. So you put it in a sling, you keep it elevated, um, and you try to get to a healthcare facility. Uh, you know, fortunately here in the United States, we deal with almost solely pit vipers, which do not paralyze you. However, in other parts of the world, there are cobras and lapids, which do paralyze you and present a whole different kind of problem um, that we don't have to deal with here, like I said, thankfully. So, you know, when you're talking about, especially Southeast Asia, that is where snake bites are a huge, huge public health problem. Uh, it's a big, big deal there, obviously, as we talked about some of the stats early on. And it really, in that situation, you're kind of depending on what snake it is and, uh, you know, because normally we don't recommend tourniquets. However, if it's a, a cobra, you might consider a tourniquet because you don't want that venom to get to your diaphragm and paralyze you so you can't breathe. So it gets really, really complicated in other parts of the world. We're kind of lucky here in the United States. And just to say, water moccasins and rattlesnakes, how are they as far as danger compared? Because that's really the other two big so, ones here. Yeah, exactly. So rattlesnakes are by far the most potent venomous snake we have here in the, in, 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 in the United States. Uh, you know, there are coral snakes, which are a relative of the cobra, but they're very rarely seen, very small. Uh, it, it's a, kind of a, a one-off sort of thing. But Rattlesnake bites, yeah, they, they cause a lot of uh, morbidity. Uh, the, the, all the mortality is pretty much associated with rattlesnake bites. Water moccasins, which we don't really have in Kansas, but are more in Missouri, are, are re reported to be very aggressive snakes. So they're kind of the one that might chase you, is what people will talk about. Uh, their bites are obviously a little worse than copperheads, but not quite as bad as, as rattlesnakes. Jess? Kathy uh, wants to know, is anti-venom generic or specific to different types? And does Dakota know which one he had? Well, I can tell you here again, in the United States, we're very lucky. We have a one size fits all anti-venom for all of our rattlesnakes, copperheads, water moccasins. We have one, uh, well, actually now two anti-venoms, but they all treat the, all the snakes. So we're very fortunate. We don't have to know exactly what snake you were bitten by, as long as it wasn't a coral snake and there's no coral snakes around here so we don't have to worry about that here in, in, in the Kansas Missouri area so basically it is a one-size-fits-all very effective it is not generic if it was generic it would be a lot less expensive how long did it take for Dakota to fully recover um, I would say it probably took me um, close to a week to fully recover um, before I was able to fully walk again um, and go back to living basically on my own and by myself because um, I had to spend a week with my mother for her, her to help me. <laughs> well, we're glad you're better. Okay, Dr. Seitz, I've got a couple for Sean, so hit me up when you get him back on the line. All right, we'll be back to you. We're going to look forward to that. In the meantime, we're going to now move to talk to uh, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention Control here at the Health System yeah. with today's COVID count. Yeah, uh, COVID count is similar to what it was and really what it has been for the last couple of weeks, high 20s. Right now we have 26 active infections with four in the ICU, three on the ventilator, unfortunately, and 18 in that recovery period. Uh, but Steve, from you know looking at the latest uh, graphs, it seems like the cases, again, the reported cases, somewhat may be on a trend, a downtrend. Um, hospitalizations maybe look to have plateaued or starting that downtrend, so hopefully we can 
hope that those trends continue. And that's certainly seeing, the, that seems to be the trend we're seeing here. I mean, we got up to around 40, 45 or acute, and so now we're down in the mid 20s. So we, I think we're seeing a, a downtrend, we like that. Yeah. But you know, Fauci yesterday said, hey, we're still ro worried about the BA5 mm -hmm. variant. Yeah. Yeah, you know, exactly. And I think we are getting into this kind of lame duck period as far as boosters, because there's a lot of questions, when should I get my booster? You know, really should have had that, if you are 50 and above, should have had that second booster quite some time ago. Now we're getting close to where they are hoping to roll out the uh, this new uh, formulation of the vaccine or booster. Again, what will the full clinical efficacy about protection from hospitalization, because we know the vaccines we have right now, if you are up to date, continue to very well protect you against hospitalization. So. So if we pop up the New York Times heat map, you know, I think the heat map, if you follow with us very much, you'll see there is less dark colors here. Still looking over to the kind of Tennessee, Kentucky, um, West Virginia, Virginia area and Ohio. But across the rest of the country, it may be decreasing just a little bit, mm -hmm. but that's probably consistent. It's no worse than plateaued. It's yeah. probably a little better to your earlier points. Yeah. And if you follow the numbers nationally, you'd say, yeah, things are starting to taper off a little. So what's going to be next, I wonder? You, you, you mentioned we're sort of in this, this um, I forgot what period you call it, some night lullaby period, something like yeah, that, where little, things are a yeah. little quieter. But, I, you know, I think the fear is the next variant uh -huh. could come along. Yeah. I'm not hearing of any the rise of any new major variant. How about right. you? Yeah, no, I think, you know, a few weeks ago there was one that was in uh, like one, two, India. One, two, three, four, something, yeah. But that really hasn't taken off. We've still seen that really that BA5. So I think uh, in some modeling early on um, this spring, they were looking towards October, November maybe being a, a new wave you know what that will be uh who knows but again that is just modeling so take it with that caveat so hopefully right now we continue to be in that lull we get through to when uh the new vaccine rollout and recommendations are and we can get people boosted at that point lull lullaby snakes on a plane we are on a roll today yeah um just to say though i think the other thing about ba5 that is important to remember is that it's incredibly highly contagious. This is like chickenpox. I mean, it's our, it's so easy to spread. But at the end of the day, yeah. um, I think the next iteration is what we may be concerned about in that if it maintains that ability to spread rapidly, people don't get another vaccine. It goes three to six months after they've had their last COVID infection. That's when things are vulnerable and you move back inside for the mm -hmm. winter when we really <clears> do hit. <throat> Alexis, those cooler months. Yeah. And so I think that's really the thing we have to look out for. And we'll yeah. stay abreast of that on this program, but that's the thing I think we have to be most uh, most concerned about. I, I think you're exactly right. And you bring up a good point about, you know, moving inside, people will be doing things more <laughs> in those uh, inside spaces, probably poorly ventilated, being close together. But remember this past influenza season, we really had two spikes. And we had quite a bit more influenza this past season than we did uh, the previous one or two seasons. So it's going to be important to evaluate for that and remember to stay up to date on that uh, vaccination as well. So it looks like school vaccine mandates for COVID-19 are not happening. We're seeing some reports about that coming across the country. It's like folks have kind of just relaxed a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I understand and get it. And I think, you know, I think the vaccine really it seems like you are going to have to do the best thing for you and your child. There was a new report in uh, CDC's MMWR recently just about, you know, everybody continues to have this myth that children are not affected by COVID-19, and that is absolutely false. Now, the rate of having complications is certainly less than older children and adolescents and adults, but they still are affected. Things like uh, higher risk of diabetes, heart complications, um, other organs as well. And so I think it's important, really protect your child as much as possible or your grandchild, uh, you know, if you, if you know children, get them vaccinated. So the one crucial step you may be missing in that COVID self-test mm -hmm. at home? Yeah, I think we are just here. It, it, it's about um, what we have talked about in the cases. You know, we know the cases are probably not reported accurately just because there are less testing sites. People are testing more at home and not reporting them or they aren't testing because they know they've been exposed and probably assume they have it as well. And so, you know, we're not getting an accurate idea of, of cases, but just as we have said, uh, Steve, 
it's probably more an accurate bellwether of really hospitalizations at this point. And what we are continuing to see is those people that are hospitalized are either unvaccinated, partially vaccinated, or not up to date with their vaccine. Or just so very severely immunocompromised yeah. and respond to anything. Okay, ABC News is reporting the CDC sending a team to New York City. There was one case of polio reported yeah. there. We haven't seen polio approximately for a very long time. <coughs> Yeah, this is, this is, you know, bad news. I think everybody should take this to heart. Um, and I say this in the context of we have vaccines to combat these vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, I think within the last year or six months, we had heard a politician somewhere wanted to do away with vaccine mandates. And this is absolutely the worst public health thing to do. This is the worst individual health thing you can do for your children. Right now, we have uh, the context of really not understanding how much morbidity and mortality, how much disease and death occurred from these diseases now that we've virtually eradicated and certainly reduced the risk of. And I think this is one more case to exemplify that if your children are not up to date with these vaccines, please go get them vaccinated. We know that the risk of poliomyelitis uh, paralysis is about uh, one in 100 to 200 cases. That's not much, but what if it is your child? Exactly. So it's, it, you know, we are going back to school. Please talk with uh, any of your healthcare providers if you have children, get them up to date with their vaccines. And just to say the long-term problem with this is, I don't wanna get vaccinated. My, I, it's a low risk of having polio, okay. You may not be paralyzed, but there are long-term complications to polio. Yeah. And having been the old guy in the room, I yeah. think I'm probably the old guy in the room. When I first started in pulmonary disease, we still saw those patients who had long-term yeah, complications okay. from the polio, yeah. the 40s and the 30s and the 50s. And it's not something you want to subject yourself to. This idea that vaccination isn't important is such a fabrication. Yeah. It's just false. Yeah. It's like, okay, guys, stay in your lane. We'll stay in our lane. We're gonna talk healthcare. You stay in your lane, wherever that lane may be. And the reality is that the reason we feel safe is because we don't see polio, right? Right? We don't see smallpox. Yeah. We don't see mumps. We don't see much measles, mumps, and rubella. But all of a sudden, if you don't have the vaccination, mm -hmm. you will see those things. Yeah. And the things you're going to see, because I've seen them, they're not pretty, Hawkeye. They're not pretty. And I think that that's a great point. Is as we our population grows, as our population gets older, as we continue to have more and peop, more and more people who have immune suppression or immune deficiency for one reason or other, whether it's chemotherapy, whether they've had a solid organ transplant, need to be on immunosuppression, whether it's a rheumatologic disease and need to be on immunosuppression, we know unequivocally that those people are more at risk of further complications from these diseases as well. So it's important to protect other people also. Okay, just one more question for you. Um, you know, I shaved my head a long time back in May for that Shave to Save event, and I'd really planned for my hair to grow back, and I'm watching myself on the screen up here on the monitor. I'm seeing that my hair is not growing back on top. Is there vaccination for that? Is that under development by the CDC? What's your recommendation? I think they need to look at some mRNA technology for that, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks for that. Glad you're, glad you're on board. All right, back to our discussion on snakes now. Joining us in the studio is Dr. Steve Thornton, the medical director for Poison Control. He's also an emergency department physician. He's also the head of toxicology here at KU. We don't talk about that enough, but that's actually approximately a very big deal. Live via Zoom is Dakota Johnston, who has been bitten by a snake. And we're also live at the Kansas City Zoo with Alexis Del Cid and zoo director Sean Putney. By the way, Sean, just to say, I love the zoo. Dr. Thornton, what are oh, some great. of the do's and don'ts? Yeah, I do. <laughs> My kids love that zoo too. Dr. Thornton, what are some of the do's and don'ts if you're bitten by a snake? And let me guess, one of the, one of the do not do is to panic. So yeah, so there's a lot of uh, don't. So, so don't panic. Um, you basically try and stay calm. Obviously easier sometimes said than done, um, but uh, n nonetheless, uh, don't cut it, don't suck it, don't electrocute it. Believe it or not, there was a thing going around where people were using electricity. Shock, uh, the, shock, shock the snake. Yeah, shock there, the there's, a, there's a theory yeah. out there that it would denature the, the venom. Um, don't uh, don't t put gunpowder in it and explode it. Um, Should I take some, um, what was it, ammonium and inject it under my skin? It was, that was one yeah, of the plans. Anything that would inject, involve injecting or cutting or sucking is all pretty bad. Um, all you're going to do there is basically cause more damage, more infection, <clears throat> uh, really cause infection. What we recommend is, again, treating it like you injured it, you know, from a sprain, strain, whatever, putting it in a splint, elevating it, and getting to a healthcare facility where they can get you evaluated and see do you need antivenom or not. Okay. So um, in the goal in the olden days, you would cut off 
Okay, wait a minute. I knew about that. That makes me old. Okay, so in the olden days, you cut off the snake's head and sucked out the venom from the bite. Bad idea. Bad idea. Bad idea. What about the cutting off of the snake's head? So, so we do get a lot of uh, beheaded Good. snakes that are brought in, it, it, primarily because folks think that we need to know exactly what snake bit them. And that is not here. Again, in the United States, that's not the, really the case. We don't need to know if it's a copperhead, water moccasin, prairie rattler, timber rattler. Uh, the, it's a one size fits all anti venom, so that's we're fortunate. So. Just leave the snake alone because there's a lot of people who end up getting bit a second or third time as they go to try to kill the snake uh, or somebody else tries to kill the snake and they get bit. So just leave the snake alone um, and, and, and get, and get health care. So once the snake bites you, does it still have venom to bite someone else? It has plenty of venom to bite somebody ah, else. Yes, an old wife's tale on that one too, that once they bite, they're going to exactly. die. Exactly. I, I, had a case, and... I had a case when I was in fellowship where three Marines got bitten by the same snake. Excellent. So, yes. That was yes. a prolific, yeah, that, was a yes. very, that was a feisty snake. So, okay, what are some of the biggest myths about snake bites? Well, I, I think a lot of the myths about how to treat it, uh, about, uh, you know, in the cutting, sucking, whatnot. Uh, really, you know, the, these are, the, these, antivenom is the gold standard treatment. Antivenom will work uh, for these, uh, the, the snake bites here, you know, in the United States. And, and all I can, you know, all I can recommend is just making sure you don't make things worse, get to a healthcare facility, and then make sure that healthcare facility is comfortable treating snake bites. Have them call the Poison Control Center. Have them call here. We'll help walk them through it. All right. Um, how many doses of antivenom do you give to somebody? It, to some degree, depends on um, how they re respond. Uh, most copperhead bites, like Dakota said, it's one dose and you're done. Okay. Uh, it, it, it does not take a lot. Rattlesnake bites can take many, many doses. Um, you know, sometimes a, a, you know, you're talking 20, 30 vials of antivenom, whereas with most copperheads, it's about four vials, sort of the, the kind of one all dose. All right. Yeah. Dakota, did you follow all this great advice that you've heard from Dr. Thornton today? Did that play out in your life? <clears throat> it, it sure has, yes. Um, one of the biggest things that he said is um, that most people probably do is don't panic um, because that was one thing that I knew not to do, but everyone else around me was starting to panic and I was like, this is not what we're not supposed to do, so don't <laughs> panic. All right, and, and, and now there's also an old story that you shouldn't run after a snake bite because it'll circulate around your body faster. Well, it, 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 in, in some sense that's, that is true. It will spread the venom a little bit faster. Um, it's not such a huge deal with our type of uh, uh, snakes, obviously in other countries where cobras and whatnot are around, that could be a little bit more problem, problematic. But again, it kind of comes back to where I said, just sling it, elevate it, splint it, what, you know, if you're in the, if you've got bit in the foot, try and get your foot elevated. Um, that'll help with the swelling in the long term as well. But uh, in general, just get to a healthcare facility. That's, that's what you want to do. Okay. Dakota, do you have long-term side effects from this bite? <clears throat> I do not. Um, I, um, feel like um, because I was bit in the ankle <clears throat> and a little bit of the, a little bit more fattier tissue um, of the ankle, um, that, that is maybe a reason why I don't have any long-term effects and, and because I got the anti-venom um, within a couple hours as well. Um, so I am lucky that I don't. It would be kind of nice to have um, maybe still a puncture wound um, and have that little scar to tell, but unfortunately <laughs> I don't have that. All right, so now Dr. Thornton, I'm gonna supposed to be out camping this weekend in the Ozark woods on a river far from help and no way to get to a car or something in the middle of the night. What do I do if I get bit by a snake there? Well, uh, depending on where you're bit, try to get it uh, immobilized. Like I said, treat, treating it like a, like a broken limb. And then uh, make sure you got someone who can drive you to a hospital. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, there's no, unfortunately, we have not yet created a uh, at the site treatment for uh, venomous snake bites. Uh, okay. People are working on stuff like that, but we don't we don't have it readily available yet. And um, if I got bit by a snake and I don't know if it was poisonous, what do I do? That's that that's a very common situation. We still recommend you go to the healthcare facility. They, what they'll do there is they'll observe you. They'll watch for that pain, swelling, like Dakota had. They'll check some blood work because not every snake bite is a venomous uh, snake bite. Not every snake bite needs antivenom. That's where we, you, you need that health professional to kind of help uh, figure that out. So can I ice my foot or leg if I'm bit there? You can certainly uh, put some cold compresses. We've had people, again, make things worse by freezing it. Uh, some people burn it. Uh, so again, in general, uh, the less is more when it comes to, to snake bites in the pre-hospital setting. Dakota, is there anything as you look back that you would do differently now? Um, 
No, I don't think so. Other than the fact of uh, maybe I would have had my flashlight on or um, had my boots on <laughs> instead of my flip flops at the time. I think that's always a good idea out in the woods in the middle of the night. By the way, as I listen to your story, you are like the perfect guest, Dakota, because you did it right. And that sends an important message to our, to our listeners. If you do it right, you can get the help you need. You can do okay. Don't do it wrong. All right, let's go back to the Alexa Stell Sid, live at the Kansas City Zoo with zoo director Sean Putney. And her new friend, Ron. Is that still Ron that's there, right. Alexis? Ron. Uh, you're, you're, Ron. You and Ron have gotten bonding. pretty acquainted. Is Ron going home with you? I know. He's been... He's been giving, I, you know, I have to ask my husband about that one. He's not the jealous type, but I don't think he'd like Ron in the house. <laughs> okay, and I one thing, question, Alexis, though, for you, you do Sean. look a little terrified. Oh, yeah. I said you still look just slightly so? terrified or uncomfortable, <laughs> well, just to say. I'm, I'm alert. I'm uh, staying alert. Player. No, I, I asked Sean if he was giving me kisses, and Sean said that every time Ron sticks out his tongue, he's actually smelling me. <laughs> Yeah, right? Right. And she's doing wonderfully. I, there's a lot of folks out there that we would probably shy away from allowing to hold the snake, but she's been doing great. Well, thank you for letting me hold him. Um, you know, we talk a lot about how to um, avoid snakes, and obviously you don't want to step on a snake and get bit. But what benefits do snakes have for the environment? Like we're told don't kill spiders because they eat mosquitoes. What do snakes do? There's a lot of benefits. Mostly they're keeping the rodent population down. Okay. Uh, in fact, there, there are some cultures down in South America that have a certain type of snake uh, sort of as pets around their households to keep the rodent population down. And as we all know, rodents oftentimes are bringing with them diseases right. that are more harmful to them than a snake would be. So um, they're very beneficial. They have their place in the world. And just because of the look of them, they do look the, the creepy crawly uh, and so much different than humans. Oftentimes the first reaction from people is to try to get them off their property or to hit them with a shovel. And chances are, if you have a snake on your property, it's because they are eating things that, uh, like mice and, and other rodents that, that you, you probably don't want, don't want there either. Do does Ron recognize you or your scent? Probably not. I don't know that I'd give him that much credit. Maybe, certainly not me. Uh, maybe with the other uh, staff. Uh, and, and, and like I said before, Ron is a part of our, or used to be a part of our outreach program. Uh -huh. So he's very used to being handled. Yeah, he, he's, he's uh, getting more calm. He mm -hmm. keeps going. When he gets into Sean's arms, he moves more slowly because you're warmer right but he tends to also want to go hang out in your armpit i let him burrow you burrow yeah. in your pit <laughs> is that because he likes to burrow in the sand all the time yeah they're lion weight predators uh what they do they, they live anywhere from egypt uh, down to kenya and 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 they'll burrow in the the sand lightly burrow in the sand and wait for animals to come by them so that they can jump up and grab them for their food we talk about snakes being venomous mm -hmm. but um i just learned this that catfish are also venomous so their spines uh and a lot of people when they're handling uh catfish you know catfish have very small teeth right um, but if you were to hold them incorrectly and happen to get one of those spines in you it's a very mild venom and i'm, I'm sure that the the other folks who are on the, the call today can go into more detail, but a lot of times you'll get some swelling associated with that really? um, because of the fact that it was kind of injected into your into your skin. That's, it's not, not like nearly as bad as, uh, as some of the venomous snakes are. But that's, this catfish has to be alive on a hook in your boat, not on your plate where like you get poked with a Correct, bone. Correct, yeah. Okay. That's good, because I like catfish. <laughs> um, what about if you want to plant things around your house? to deter snakes? What would you plant? So, what would you so I don't know that I would recommend uh, any sort of plant. There's nothing out there that I can think of that snakes uh, would not like. The, the oh. problem with planting stuff around your house is you're, you're allowing for more potential homes for rodents and more oh. potential homes for these guys to hang out. Okay. So if you have uh, rock gardens and other things for, for snakes to, to hide in and, and crawl around, you're really providing a better environment for them to hang out. 
Do you ever have wild snakes come onto the zoo property to kind of check out sure. their snake friends at the condos? Uh, not, they don't necessarily come in here to uh -huh. hang out, but, uh, but we do have plenty of snakes on zoo grounds. Uh, we do see copperheads two or three times really? a year. Um, but very, very uncommon. Uh, most of the snakes that we have are black snakes or water snakes. And do people report them to you? Yes. Uh, okay. In fact, a lot of times we'll get reports of the water snakes being water moccasins, Ooh. and we have to yes. do a little educational moment. Because they do look like. A, a little similar. A little bit. I'm going to toss it back to the studio because I know Jess said she had lots of viewer well, questions I, I, for well, you no, as well. Out. I, get, I, I get a Dr. question Stites with Sean does. first. I have a question for Sean. Sean. Okay, okay. You've, you've mentioned yes. some creatures that are not troublesome, but I want to know what you guys are trying to do one of the most troublesome venomous creatures in Missouri, chiggers. Have you solved chiggers? Hmm. Oh, uh, we uh, we don't do too much about them. Uh, fortunately, we do keep all of our areas that are right beside the pathways nicely mowed, so people aren't going to get chiggers jumping on them. What eats okay. chiggers? Uh, other insects. So, we need more of those other insects. Um, but that's what I think. But I but I don't know I, I don't know exactly uh, which which those would be. So yeah, they're not a favorite of mine either. Right. All right. They're not a fan We're, favorite. No. Yeah, not not so much. God did not make many mistakes. Chiggers could be one. <laughs> Jess, I'm going to come back to you for some questions, either reporter or community. Okay. So okay. I first of all, Alexis, I have to say. Like I said, better woman than me. I was kind of jealous that you got to go out there today, and now I'm mm. watching you. My heart is right. racing, and I'm thinking, I wouldn't have even been able to stand next to Sean holding that snake. So you are in the right spot you know what? today. Do you remember the VMAs where Britney Spears held the snake? Yes, that's you. Okay, it was this kind of a snake. It was well, Louise, not, not Ron. Okay, so I have a question about Louise actually for okay. Sean because you hear these scary stories in the news about someone having a python like that as a pet and them wrapping themselves around you. So my question to Sean, is that, nat is that natural? Is that just what pythons like that do? Are they naturally prone to wrap themselves around someone, even an owner that they're loyal to? So you have to remember that uh, many snakes are climbers, so uh, it is common for snakes to wrap themselves around people because they feel more comfortable when they're, when they're wrapped around, like, so they're not going to fall. Now, ground dwellers like Louise, uh, they are constrictors and um, the bigger they get, the bigger the prey they, they want to have. So there have been cases where uh, a, a very large uh, Burmese python has been known to kill humans, especially younger ones. So you have to be really careful when you're choosing pets and what you're allowing them and, and not allowing them to do. But for the most part, snakes aren't going to see humans as a food source and they're not going, to, they're, especially wild snakes, uh, the majority of them are just trying to get away from you. And I, I'm sure that uh, everybody would agree that the majority of snake bites happen uh, just by happenstance or defense mechanism by the snakes. Uh, Kathy wants to know what's a typical lifespan of a snake? Maybe Sean, you can tell us what the lifespan of those snakes are. And then Dr. Thornton, what about just our local snake population? So a, a real good rule of thumb uh, for snake lives, 20, year old, 20 years old is a pretty old snake. And, and the bigger they are, usually the longer lifespan they have. So most of your smaller snakes, the common snakes from around here, 20 years would, would be a long life for them. But something uh, along the lines of, of a Burmese python, they might get to be 40 or 50 years old or more. Hey, so I, I, I would Ron echo that. Ron is fascinated that, uh, with the camera. That most of our uh, local snakes are going to be in the 10, 5 to 10 kind of Obviously, shorter lifespans when they interact with humans, that's uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Jennifer mm -hmm. wants to know, is, um, so if somebody has been bit by a snake like Dakota, are they now immune to it now that they've had the antivenom? And what does that mean for future snake bites? Hopefully Dakota won't have any more, but what if he did? 
So that, that's an interesting question. We, haven't, <clears throat> we don't have a lot of repeat offenders in that regard. Um, mm -hmm. In theory, there, there, there could be a little bit of immunity. Um, we do know from uh, herpetologists who've like, uh, worked at zoos in the past that uh, certainly getting bit multiple times can, in, can endow some degree of immunity, but I'm not sure if, it, if just one is enough, uh, to, to be honest. You don't need a booster. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> right. yeah maybe, maybe there's right. a randomized, randomized controlled trial. Yeah, we're, we're still waiting to enroll the patient. Yeah, that, yeah people be in a that tough study. One, I yeah. think. Not, okay. not too quick for the enrollment. Vince uh, actually has a booster question. Do you need a polio boost, booster? Hmm. You know, right now we, we don't know uh, the extent of that durability of that uh, vaccine, but right now there is no recommendation to need a polio booster. Now, I went back to my immunization records and you know we we used to get the oral polio vaccine which they use in most parts of the world especially where it's more difficult to get to those immunization campaigns and getting those out to the people right now in the united states we use the injectable type but um, there's no recommendation right now for polio vaccine if you've had the vaccine uh, you will be protected from that disease especially that um, the uh, the poliomyelitis um, paralysis disease. And we really don't see much late onset polio <clears throat> from people who have gotten vaccinated. It's not mm -hmm. like when you hit 70 or 80. It's only a population that may be at risk for something like BMT and things like that, but bone marrow transplants, et cetera. But really, it's not a disease we see frequently. And we would know if it was because people get such severe respiratory complications like when they do contract polio later, later in mm -hmm. life as opposed to earlier in life. So. Okay, last question is from Michelle. She says that she's heard that even non-venomous snakes can carry diseases like rabies. Is that true and how common if it is? So <clears throat> snakes um, can carry some certain bacteria. They do not carry rabies, um, but uh, uh, <clears throat> salmonella complicates uh, some uh, reptiles. Uh, interesting though, uh, almost all of our venomous snake bites, uh, they, none of them get infected. We don't treat them with antibiotics. Um, so that's actually one thing we don't have to worry about with the venomous snake bites. But like with any animal, there's always potential for them carrying some bacteria, but rabies would not be one of them. All right. Well, this has been a pretty cool program today. I, I, I've actually, I've learned a lot. I'm reminded of that song, I don't like spiders and snakes, but I've got what it takes to love you, something like that. <laughs> I don't know what that song really means. It's kind of odds and words may be a little odd. I may have messed it up. But I think it's that means that Alexis Del Cid is in love with Ron. I think her husband should be con concerned <laughs> because I think she's got a new person or a man <laughs> or in snake. her life. Or snake. That's got all right. A new man all in right. my life. I know usually women avoid snakes, right? Well we're we're here for no, you, Alexis. Ron's we're not causing I'd like. we're not gonna cause any aspersions on your character there though. So um, yeah. Thank you. Let, no let's, judgments, right? Yes. But, all right. Let's get back uh, to Alexis. So, uh, final thoughts from Zoo Director Sean Putney. Sean, thank you for being on the program today. Final thoughts. Oh, thanks for letting us be a part of it. We appreciate Fine. it and hope to see you all at the zoo sometime soon. All right. I'm going to turn next to. to say go, to ahead. People, go ahead. I was Alexis. just going to ask Sean, you know, if you have any message for people who are terrified of snakes. Like Jess is sitting back there and, you know, I mean, I got to say, it's really not scary when you're actually holding the snake and it, um, what would you say to other people who are frightened of snakes and afraid? I mean, there's a difference between cautious and then. Well, I definitely say always be cautious, yeah. especially if you don't know what type of snake you're dealing with. Yeah. But just remember that, that uh, snakes do serve a purpose. So just killing them for being there uh, doesn't really help matters at all. Um, there are ways that you can uh, calm your fears, but you know, with a lot of phobias, there's just not much you can do about it. So I, I have seen some people uh, try to go and, and touch snakes mm -hmm. and, and to just ease their fears. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to want to hold a snake like you are. Uh, or it doesn't mean they should go out and just grab any old snake. Oh, in definitely their not. Definitely right. don't do that. Right. All right. Yeah, let's have let, let's make sure we train people the correct way around that. Let's go turn to Dakota Johnston. Dakota, final thoughts for today. I'm sorry. What was that? Final thoughts for today. Um, <clears throat> kind of like Sean said, um, you should definitely stay away from snakes. Um, doesn't matter um, if they're poisonous or not. I um, did not have a, a phobia of snakes before, but I definitely do now and do have a little PTSD um, from it, even though it was a uh, a smooth sail for me compared to what other people have to endure, I'm sure. 
All right, um, so now you have a little ophidiophobia. I just want to say that word one more time on the program. The, uh, <laughs> and also, you're a farm tech, I understand, from at LMH. So you, you, I'm sure you're dedicated. They, they sound like they good, took great care of you. And as a farm tech, you, you may have been be responsible now for dispensing anti-venom to patients. Um, yes, I've actually never had the luxury of um, mixing it uh, myself, and I don't actually um, do that part of the job anymore. Um, but it um, does take quite a while um, to mix it. So um, that is why it's uh, very important to get um, uh, to a healthcare facility um, as fast as you can um, and get the anti-venom if need be. All right. Well, thank you for being on the program today. Dr. Thornton, thanks for being back. Yes, thank Final you. Final thoughts. <clears throat> Uh, well, I, I would echo the live and let live when it comes to snakes. And uh, if you are bitten, just stay calm and get to a healthcare facility. All right. Excellent advice. Dr. Hawk? Yeah. Just good show, good information. Uh, you know, again, hope everybody stay safe and we'll continue to endorse the fact if you uh, are needing to be up to date on your vaccines, please check with your medical providers, check with your child's pediatrician, get everybody up to date on vaccines. Um, and really, they work. They will protect you and reduce those risks of those complications. Well, somehow today my final thought is this. I was trying to tie Star Trek into this because they had Gorin, which are reptiles. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was going to try and make some reference to things. I couldn't quite make it work today. Usually I can come up with strange ways and bring back Star Trek. I would like to also then hum the theme to Raiders of the Lost Ark. But I believe that's a copyright infringement. <coughs> Though for my singing, no one could really tell that. So I think I could deny it. But at the end of the day, what I hope you take away from this program is this. Mother Nature is full of wonderful surprises, and the best thing you could do with snakes is leave them alone because they're a really important part of our life overall and the things they help to protect us from. We just need to respect that with snakes. Let's go back to Jess. Jess, what's coming up tomorrow? All right, leave snakes alone. You did not have to tell me that twice. I got you, loud and clear. Okay, so uh, the pandemic, as we know, has caused sky-high anxiety levels for many people. We're gonna take a look back at one of our most popular shows featuring a therapist from Turning Point, Jamie Kopakin had some excellent advice on how to handle the stress. And we're gonna have that Encore episode for you tomorrow at eight o'clock. And of course, we'll be back live on Friday at 8 a.m. So go out there, make it a great day. More than 2 million people this summer have been impacted by air travel problems. And that's causing a lot of stress and anxiety. I'm Jessica Lovell, coming up Friday, how to limit the mental turbulence here on the ground. See you at eight on these social media channels. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.